The following is a CNN special report. Last fall, the legendary Bill Cosby was restaking his claim as an A-list superstar at the age of 77. Bill Cosby was really looking at a career rejuvenation. 30 years after his NBC blockbuster, the network was cooking up another Cosby sitcom. Netflix had plans to stream a comedy special, and a 500-page biography was a New York Times bestseller. And then it hits. An avalanche of sexual assault allegations. And he offered me a large white pill. The last thing I remember, I, was, I had blacked out and Cosby mounting me. He drug and raped me. You are such a perverted creep. And now, shocking newly released court documents show Cosby talking about a powerful sedative. In a deposition, the plaintiff's lawyer asks, when you got the quaaludes, was it in your mind that you were going to use these quaaludes for young women that you wanted to have sex with? Cosby responds, yes. Do you see this as sort of the smoking gun that's been missing in all these allegations? Bill Cosby has not been charged with any crimes, yet he has gone from one of America's most revered entertainers to one of its most reviled. Even Las Vegas canceled his show. When, when you're too sleazy for Vegas, <laughs> No laughing matter. Inside the Cosby allegations. Denver, Colorado. It's a thousand miles from Los Angeles, 2,000 miles from New York City. But Denver is where Barbara Bowman decided she could grow up to be an actress. I was a go-getter. I was adventurous. You know, I wanted this career. I had a passion to do this. Have a good run. By 16, she was starring in local commercials. Come on up to Colorado's favorite ski resort. We guarantee you'll notice the difference. And by 17, she was ready to audition for a superstar, Bill Cosby. He was America's favorite dad. He was everyone's father figure that they watched on TV every, every week. Cosby was friends with Bowman's talent agent, Joe Farrell. Tell me about your agent. Can you describe her? Well, she was known in town as the Barracuda. Joe Farrell herself told the local Kiwanis Club, if being a Barracuda means I work very hard, protect my people, and being a good businesswoman, then I accept it. Her talent agency, JF Images, had a big reputation. And Barbara Bowman had what it took to be a star. And she would come in there and lay down the law. You think this is tough? Wait till you get to the next level. You think I'm tough? So get used to it now. Bowman's shot at the next level, she says, came in 1985. Bill Cosby was coming to Denver, and her agent said he was scouting for potential stars. So when he came into town and she selected me, you know, it was a big deal. A big deal because Cosby was the quintessential success story, rising from the projects of Philadelphia to the heights of Hollywood. You don't get larger or more successful than Bill Cosby unless you're Barack Obama. Bob Huber covers Cosby for Philadelphia Magazine. He was the first leading black man on a network uh, back in the mid-60s. Cosby's performance in I Spy won him three consecutive Emmys. But that was nothing compared to what came next. By 1985, he had become a television juggernaut with The Cosby Show. What you need to do now is go to the next level if you want Justine back. What's that? Begging. <laughs> For eight seasons on NBC, he starred as the lovable Dr. Cliff Huxtable, patriarch of an upper-middle-class family that defied racial stereotypes, revived the sitcom genre, and generated megabucks in syndication. It made him a huge, huge star, not only in the African-American world, but of course for white middle-class Americans as well. 
Barbara Bowman says the plan was to audition for the superstar at the turn of the century nightclub. She was nervous, excited, groomed, and ready to meet Bill Cosby. It was a moment that would change her life. When we come back... At one point, I went like this and started to move his hands away, and he just said, no, you can't do that. You need to relax. Cosby has earned millions of fans, hundreds of millions of dollars, and the admiration of many, including colleagues like Felicia Rashad. He's a genius. He is generous, he's kind, he's inclusive. In 1985, with Cosby's popularity soaring, Barbara Bowman says she was tapped by her agent to audition for him at a Denver nightclub. She recalls he asked about her childhood. He zeroed right in on the fact that I really was sort of a vulnerable kid, no dad, no father figure in my life, and wanted to take on that role. And it was an honor to be there, and I wanted him to care about me like a father would care about a daughter. Then, she says, it was showtime to see how well this budding actress could perform. He wanted me to do an acting improv exercise where I was um, intoxicated. So he explained to me that it was going to be a little uncomfortable, that if we're really authentic in our acting, we'd have to tap in and let my guard down um, and trust him. He had me close my eyes and proceed to act drunk. And he's behind me and he's, you know, and he's stroking my hair and stroking my neck and, you know, and kind of rubbing my shoulders and getting me to relax. And meanwhile, his hands are moving down onto my breasts. And at one point I went like this and started to move his hands away and he just said, no, you can't do that. You need to relax. For a 17 year old aching to be an actress, she says it was confusing. You know, and I wanted to trust him. I really, really, really wanted to trust him. Bowman's agent, Joe Farrell, is now retired. She declined to comment to CNN, but in 2006, she told the Denver Post, I don't know the truth of it. It's mind boggling. I don't set up interviews in bars, and it makes me sad because my reputation has always been golden in this city. I have never seen Cosby to be anything but a gentleman. That's what Bowman says she wanted to believe, too. And that he was really going to groom me and mentor me and that he had a lot that he could offer me. Bowman says Cosby soon invited her to see some of his shows. There was Seattle and then Reno. There, he pressured her to perform a scene in his hotel room. He turned out the lights and he made me close my eyes and went through an exercise, a trust exercise. That was sexual? That was sexual. He had his pants off? Yes. And were you? Or down, at he least. He had his pants down, and he forced your hand on him. Yes. And were you drugged? I don't know, but I know that I was frigid and frozen with fear and just went into a zone mm -hmm. and mechanically went through the motion. I felt so violated and I felt like disgusted. I couldn't tell anybody, I felt dirty. Why was it not an option to tell anyone at the agency about what happened? I was full of shame and fear um, and disgust. It was just too far-fetched for anyone to believe how were you able to get past that to see him again? A coping mechanism, a survival mode kicked in. I just, it was, I was so shocked that I wanted to just believe it didn't happen. 
you know, it was way back when nobody sued anybody. After working as a model and then for JF Images, Diane McFarland knew how the acting business could be. And I think there was a lot of confusion with these girls about maybe everybody has to do a little something. So it was, it was terrifying and you wouldn't know what to do. McFarland says Bowman would eventually confide in her. And when she came to you, what were those conversations like? Uh, I just remember that she was traumatized by, from sexual abuse. I don't remember the details. I just remember the tears and holding her and telling her she'd be okay. McFarland now wishes she had done more to protect Bowman. I would have lost my job, and that was scary. But, you know, I'm just a different person now, too. I'm not excusing it. For about a year, Bowman took classes and prepared until she says her agent, Joe Farrell, declared her ready for New York. She was looking to always graduate her talent into the big leagues. So Bowman left college for the Big Apple. Just getting off the plane was like, oh my gosh, I'm really here. Bowman says her agent and Cosby paid for her apartment and classes at this acting school. I felt you know, that this was an amazing opportunity. An opportunity that, with hard work, might lead to a role on TV's number one show. Was the thinking that Bill Cosby was recruiting to be on The Cosby Show? Yes, not, not necessarily like I'm taking you out of Denver, we're taking you to New York and you're going to be on the show, but that was all part of the menu of items that were going to be available. Success for the actress also meant success for the agent. Millions of young women want to be actresses, and I've got a team of people behind me that believe in me, that care about me. I felt lucky. But Bowman says that feeling would change drastically. When we come back... I was drugged. I was assaulted, and I was raped. And later, in newly released court documents, Cosby reveals his secret about drugs and sex. City, the big time. It was here a now 18-year-old Barbara Bowman hoped she could find the acting career she dreamed of. With the backing of her agent and Bill Cosby, one of the country's biggest superstars, she thought she had a shot. I'm gonna prove it that I have it in me and I'm gonna be the model actor, model student and they were gonna open those doors for me. Open those doors, she says, as long as she played by their rules. I found myself in New York then under complete and utter control um, of him and my agent. I became very isolated. I was put into an apartment and I was supposed to just very, you know, stay on the straight and narrow, go straight to acting classes, come straight back. The rude awakening came here, Bill Cosby's Manhattan brownstone. When's the last time you saw this? That night. She says Cosby invited her over for what was supposed to be tutoring. I had one glass of wine, um, went upstairs, started the acting exercise, and that was it. I just remember put, putting the, the script down because I needed, like I was feeling fuzzy, dizzy. It was like a lobotomy where you're there, you're awake, but you're not there, you're vacant and just the baffled state of mind. Next thing I know, I'm in the bathroom 
and um, I am throwing up. Bowman says she didn't know why she was throwing up. Cosby would tell her she drank too much, but she says she never even finished her glass of wine. So as I'm throwing up over the toilet, and he's right here, and the robe is, it's tied, but it's open, and the boxer shorts are open, and his penis is out and brushing against my back. Your panties are on you or off you? They're like on and pulled over to the side and like all messed up. And I knew what happened. How did you know what happened? Um, because a woman knows. And I was, I was wet and dirty. I was drugged. I was assaulted. And I was raped. And this time, Bowman says she mustered the courage to tell her agent, Joe Farrell, back in Denver. And she did nothing and insinuated that that didn't happen. That's, I mean, what are you talking about? How could you say such a thing? Farrell has said that conversation never happened, telling the Denver Post the women she represented never said anything to me about this. But back in New York, Barbara Bowman says she was distraught. And I was so freaked out, and getting that response was just crushing. Unable to get support from her agent, Bowman says she turned to a lawyer. He didn't believe me and, and called my, my claims preposterous. That's Bill Cosby you're talking about. And laughed me out of the office. That's all it took. That's all it took was one more person not to believe me. Demoralized and alone, Bowman did not file a police report. After that, why didn't you sever all contact with him? It wasn't like that. I was a prisoner. I was completely and utterly dependent. Dependent and with no choice. When she says Cosby and her agent moved her to Long Island, 25 miles away from Manhattan. And why did they move you out here? I don't know, you know. I felt like they were hiding me in this tiny little world and I was isolated from everybody. One of the rules was no visitors. It was very restricted. Restricted? isolated and controlled, she says. It was like I was always on edge. It was while you were living here that Atlantic City happened. Yes. Bill Cosby invited me down to the, the shore. He was performing down there. She went. Once she got to her hotel room, Bowman says she realized her luggage was missing and she started to panic. I felt very vulnerable and just, I wanted my stuff. And I started to call from his room because he called me down to the room. And as soon as I picked up the phone, and started calling concierge, he started to ha just go crazy and slam the phone down and told me not to worry about the luggage and, and turn the lights out. Bowman says all she remembers is waking up the next morning in her room, undressed with her suitcase. And um, I get a call from Cosby, and he summons me over to his room, yelling at me. What was he yelling at you about? That I embarrassed him, and that I was loud, and that I let the whole hotel know that I was there. And now the hotel's going to wonder what he's doing with a 19-year-old girl and his suite, and what's the big deal about the luggage, and on and on and on. Cosby, she says, became violent as she described in a phone call to her best friend, Denise Victor. She told me, you know, it's Bill Cosby, it's Bill Cosby. He threw me down on the bed, jumped on top of me, straddled me, put his arm under my throat. She kept saying, he's an animal, he's an animal. And I am laying there like this, I'm just begging him, screaming and crying, stop, please stop, get off me, get off me, I'm screaming, I'm kicking him from behind like this, and he is struggling with all his might to get his pants off and undo his belt buckle. 
she kept saying, you know, I fought him, I fought him hard. The belt buckle's getting caught and it's clinking and making all this racket and he adjusted his grip and was went then for like my pants and I wiggled out and it was like, it was like the, a light switch just clicked and it was like he snapped into reality and kind of caught himself that he was creating this huge scene. He just, just was seething and just finger in my face and, and just called me a baby and he kicked me out and he said, you're done, that's it. And I literally went back to Denver with the clothes on my back. It was over. Bowman tried to pick up the pieces of her life and restarted her career with roles in several films. Oh, I am checking it out. She tried to put Bill Cosby out of her mind for the next 20 years. And I thought I was the only one. That is until 2005, when another woman took on Bill Cosby in court and Bowman decided to join the fight. I said, I will be damned if I will sit in silence anymore. I will do whatever it takes to let people know that that woman is telling the truth. Barbara Bowman, determined to succeed in a tough business, tried to put Cosby out of her mind. She felt she had to. I was scared to death. And in my world, I didn't think I had anybody else who was listening. 20 years would pass from the time Bowman says she was raped until 2005, when she read about another woman accusing Bill Cosby of sexual assault. I really believed I was the only other one. I thought, oh my God, another woman. And I became enraged and I said, I will be damned if I will sit in silence anymore. I will do whatever it takes to let people know that that woman is telling the truth because it happened to me. That woman was Andrea Constand. Andrea Constand was director of operations for the women's basketball program at Temple University in Philadelphia. <laughs> There, she met Bill Cosby, a Temple graduate and very big man on campus. We all know he was a very active alum, and he, that included the women's basketball team. Diana Moskovitz from the online sports site Deadspin has reported on Constand and Cosby. He befriended her. He would have her over for dinner parties, sometimes just for dinner with just the two of them. She thought he was just someone who wanted to mentor her. But in January 2005, Constand told authorities that Cosby sexually assaulted her at his home in suburban Philadelphia the year before. Bruce Castor was the county prosecutor at the time. Witness and Mr. Cosby. The impressions the detectives gave me about Andrea were that she was clearly telling the truth, but that her recollection was fuzzy. A fuzzy memory that he says is consistent with victims of date rape drugs. We actually were building the theory that she had been drugged. Cosby's lawyer called the accusations utterly preposterous and truly bizarre. But Cosby agreed to talk to detectives. Cosby, I believe, felt he was going to be arrested uh, and was frightened. In the end, the prosecutor decided there was not enough evidence to bring charges. What I think and what I can prove are two different things. Undeterred, Constand filed a civil suit against Cosby, laying out her accusations for everyone to see. She's so important because she was the first woman to come forward and say this, and come forward and say it with her name. She claimed Cosby had invited her to his home, offering career advice. She was talking to him because she was thinking about a career change. She was very nervous about it, wanted his, his advice on it. And she's talking about how nervous she is. And he offers her three pills. Says this will help calm you down. Constant says he told her they were an herbal medication. But in his court response, Cosby says they were one and one half tablets of Benadryl. 
And she trusted him. She trusted him. He, he's Bill Cosby. Constan claimed that after taking the pills, she was only barely conscious. She felt dizzy. She felt weak. There wasn't much she could do. Unable to walk on her own, Constan said Cosby led her to a sofa. Takes her to the sofa. He touched her breasts, touches her vagina. Eventually, he digitally penetrates her. Answering the accusations, Cosby denied drugging or sexually assaulting her. He is telling the media that this is all made up, that this family is just in it for money, that they're trying to, you know, extort money from him. As part of her civil suit, Andrea Constant was lining up one witness after another. When I finally got in touch with her attorney and said, my name is Barbara Bowman, and it happened to me too. And she told me, you're not the only one. Far from it. In all, 12 women listed in court documents as Jane Doe's had similar accusations. Long past the statute of limitations, but nonetheless willing to testify about an alleged pattern of wrongdoing. Most of the women wanted to stay anonymous, but a few went public. He produced two capsules. California yeah, attorney said, oh, Tamara Green on the Today Show. Groping me and kissing me and touching me and handling me. Cosby's lawyer said the incident she describes did not happen. I did not ever deserve that. Former model Beth Ferrier talked to the Philadelphia Daily News. He hurt me in the most wicked, horrible way. Spokesman for Cosby declined to comment. And Barbara Bowman in Philadelphia Magazine. What happened was horrible, painful, and frightening. Cosby's lawyer called Bowman's claims absolutely untrue. But Bowman, Green, Ferrier, and the others would not back down. I want people to know that we are real people out here and that it is happening, and I am going to let people know. Let people know by testifying in Andrea Constand's civil case. But when we come back, Constand versus Cosby takes an abrupt turn. And it just seems to disappear into the ether almost. By late 2006, four women had publicly accused Bill Cosby of drugging and sexually assaulting them. Andrea Constand in her lawsuit against Cosby. He took me into Tamara Green, Beth Ferrier, and Barbara Bowman. Allegations like these would bring down most public figures, but not Bill Cosby. I wrote my 6,500 word piece for Philadelphia Magazine thinking that with all these women claiming that they have stories similar to Andrea Constant's, this thing is going to explode. But it did not, at least not in 2006, because Cosby and Andrea Constant reached an out-of-court settlement. The terms were never made public, and when the lawsuit ended, so did the media interest. It would get a little bit of a media attention, it would go away, and the mainstream wouldn't touch it. Nobody would touch it. Cosby maintained his image as America's favorite dad. If you really wanted to seek it out, you could find it, or you could just go about your day watching Cosby Show reruns and have no idea that this had ever happened. Though Cosby remained silent about the allegations, he had plenty to say on other matters. Your 13-year-old son got no business seeing himself as a man who can drop a seed and walk away and somehow call himself a man. He toured the country, urging African Americans to take personal responsibility. You were dealing drugs to each other. You were impregnating our 13, 12, 11 year old children to each other. He billed these controversial lectures as call outs. I'm calling you out and I'm holding you accountable. It's a pretty big irony that he's lecturing African-American communities about their behavior and what they need to do. And at the same time, if these allegations are true, 
certainly hiding behind his own behavior. For the next eight years, Cosby was mostly out of the entertainment spotlight, but the accolades continued. Bill Cosby would go off into the sunset unless there was some drama, unless there was something to happen to trigger a change. That trigger would be an up-and-coming comedian named Hannibal Burris. Let's get some TV. Pull your pants up, black people. I was on TV in the 80s. <laughs> Last October, Burris called out Cosby in a stand-up routine. I can talk down to you because I had a successful sitcom. Yeah, it was great women, Bill Cosby, so I had a crazy damn couple of notches. He accused Bill Cosby very directly of being a rapist, and that changed everything. It changed everything because on that evening, a reporter from Philadelphia Magazine was in the audience recording this video with his phone. Yeah, great women, Bill Cosby, so... so... You heard about this Hannibal Burris thing. Right, Hannibal Burris. <laughs> By comedian Hannibal Burris. Hannibal oh. Burris. The video goes viral. Hannibal Burris called Cosby a rapist. Soon, Team Cosby is also using social media, inviting fans to create memes or captions using classic photos from his website. What a huge miscalculation. Did they really think they were going to combat Hannibal Burris and what he said by some sort of initiative of people saying nice things with these old photos of Bill Cosby. Whether or not it was a tactical move, meme me backfires. People use the memes to lambaste Cosby about the rape allegations. Barbara Bowman sees the irony. It took a man to crack a joke on stage in a comedy routine calling Bill Cosby a rapist for people to go, wow, maybe there's something to this. A month after the Burris video, Bowman writes a piece for the Washington Post online. Bill Cosby raped me. Why did it take 30 years for people to believe my story? So joining me now, Barbara Bowman. She alleges she was raped by Bill Cosby. Bowman also tells her story on CNN. I've been speaking out publicly and trying to have the story um, believed and heard since 2004. Rape allegations. Now the media are finally picking up the story. against Bill Cosby. Over at the Smithsonian, where Bill and his wife Camille are displaying their African-American art collection. This question gives me no pleasure, Mr. Cosby. NPR's Scott Simon asks about the rape allegations. There have been uh, serious allegations raised about you in recent days. You're shaking your head no. I'm in the news business, I have to ask the question. Do you have any response to those charges? Shaking your head no. The Associated Press also tries to get a response. I have to ask about your name coming up in the news recently regarding this comedian. No, no, we don't answer that. Cosby berates the reporter for even bringing up the subject. And I would appreciate it if it was scuttled. I think if you want to consider yourself to be serious, mm -hmm. that it will not appear anywhere. It didn't play well. It didn't look good for Bill Cosby. Under mounting pressure, Cosby's camp responds to the renewed allegations. The fact that they are being repeated does not make them true. Mr. Cosby does not intend to dignify these allegations with any comment. But one thing is clear. Reporters who for years failed to ask Cosby the hard questions are now paying attention. And this time, the story is not going away. We believe the women! We believe the women! When we come back... He drug and raped me. More than two dozen women come forward. Bill Cosby appears to think that rape is a joke. And new revelations in Cosby's own words about drugs and sex. this because I have really good survival skills. For more than a decade, Barbara Bowman has been fighting, 
telling a story few people wanted to hear. You know, I feel sad for me. In the fall of 2014, she pushes again, this time with a first-person account in the Washington Post. It's not that it's just me. And a round of TV interviews. Victims don't come out. They don't talk. They're ashamed. They're embarrassed. Every bit of media that I did was directed at victims. I practically pleaded for them to come forward. Rape allegations by multiple women. And this time, they do. When I came to, I was in bed with him naked. The next week, an avalanche of accusations in the media, as women allege that Cosby sexually assaulted them during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Then he started to push himself on top of me like against the seat. I was kind of leaning forward and he was behind me having sex with me. The stories just keep coming. Several claim they were drugged. Well, I was feeling more and more groggy. Including former Playboy playmate Victoria Valentino. And then he opened his fly and he forced me to perform oral sex. And he turned me over. And when he was done, he got up and he started to walk out. It went blank and former talent agency secretary, Christina Rooley. He had his hand on the back of my head and he was trying to push it towards his erect penis. I lifted my head away and pulled myself away immediately. Cosby's lawyer says the allegations are absurd. These brand new claims about alleged decades old events are becoming increasingly ridiculous. And it is completely illogical that so many people would have said nothing done nothing and made no reports to law enforcement or asserted civil claims if they thought they had been assaulted over a span of so many years. Rape is not a joke. As for Cosby's comeback, the damage is done. We believe the women! Netflix shelves his comedy special. NBC abandons its plans for an upcoming sitcom. And TV Land stops airing reruns of The Cosby Show. People believe these women now, and nobody wants to be associated with a man who's being accused of being a serial rapist. Cosby breaks his silence to a local paper in Florida. I know people are tired of me not saying anything, but a guy doesn't have to answer to innuendos. People should fact check. People shouldn't have to go through that and shouldn't answer to innuendos. I want people to know that I had an encounter with Bill Cosby. He built my trust by pretending to be a friend. He drug and raped me. I couldn't move or say anything. I felt something warm on my legs. In the weeks that follow, the number of accusers grows to more than two dozen. I knew he had drugged me. Cosby was on top of me, kissing me forcefully. I woke up in a bed, naked, bruised, he was laying next to me. Bill Cosby declined our request for an interview. But last December, Cosby's wife of more than 50 years, Camille Cosby, released this statement. The man I met and fell in love with and whom I continue to love is the man you all knew through his work. He is a kind man, a generous man, a funny man, and a wonderful husband, father, and friend. He is the man you thought you knew. A different man has been portrayed in the media over the last two months. It is the portrait of a man I do not know. A little wave, a little wave. A portrait, Mrs. Cosby says, painted by irresponsible media. None of us will ever want to be in the position of attacking a victim, but the question should be asked, who is the victim? A whole new chapter for the many accusers of Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby under oath. Now, seven months later, the question is once again in the headlines, triggered by new information. Is this really the slam dunk that vindicates Cosby's dozens of accusers? It's in the 2005 case filed by Andrea Constand from Temple University's athletic program. Sealed court documents released after the Associated Press pushed for them in court contain a startling admission. In a deposition, Cosby says that in the 1970s, he had prescriptions for the hypnotic sedative Quaalude. Constance's lawyer asks, when you got the Quaaludes, was it in your mind that you were going to use these Quaaludes for young women that you wanted to have sex with? Cosby responds, yes. 
Question. Did you ever give any of those young women the quaaludes without their knowledge? Cosby's lawyer tells his client, do not answer it. Now, accusers who have stood their ground are voicing their relief and a sense of vindication. I was absolutely elated. I, I couldn't stop just screaming, you know. I was just going, oh my God, oh my God. I mean, because obviously we already knew. And it's high time that the world finally starts to look and see directly at Mr. Cosby and that he's the one at fault, not us. It is a game changer and it's about time. Cosby's legacy, already clouded, hangs in the balance. Professionally, you can't deny his success, you can't deny his career, you can't deny the importance of The Cosby Show. He's Mr. Huxtable, but then you also have to look at the man who created that character, Bill Cosby, and everything he's accused of doing, and also remember that. Because the statute of limitations has expired on almost all the alleged incidents, it's unlikely Cosby will ever face criminal charges. But for Barbara Bowman, the long battle has been worth it. I have to imagine that there's a sinking feeling somewhere in his gut that it's over. In the days we spent with her last fall, she shared painful, intimate details about the past 30 years. And she was stoic. That is, until the end of our last interview. Oh my God. People are listening, my story's told, I'm not lying, and now people know it. And um, I'm so sad for all of us, but it validates every one of us to be able to compare our stories and see the similarities and knowing in our heart, finally, did it happen? Did it happen? Did it really happen? Yes, it really happened. And it's over. It's over.